Okay, so as you all know, uh, I know a lot of you. Uh, I've been coming there to lecture for years. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at Radboud Institute of Health Sciences, cl clinical instructor at UC Riverside School of Medicine in both the Department of Radiology and Internal Medicine, and Chief Research Officer at Halo Diagnostics. Uh, my one disclosure is that I have a patent pending for the surgical technique that was described to you earlier during the introduction. So tonight, what we're gonna talk about is a few things, the history of biopsy strategies, the evolution of multi-parametric MRI of the prostate, technical aspects of MRI-guided biopsies, the rationale for MRI-guided laser focal therapy of prostate cancer, an update on our clinical trial, NCT 02243033, which is a phase two clinical trial. Uh, phase one for safety and feasibility is long over, and phase two is no longer accruing patients, but we're observing them for 20 years and went commercial about two years ago. So we offer it in a clinical commercial setting, but the research subjects are no longer being accrued. I'm also gonna to touch on Decipher, tissue-based genomics, and then I've got two pieces of good news for you at the very end. So my early work was in breast MRI and finding ways to better and earlier diagnose a breast cancer, especially in women with dense breasts, um, and how to do in-bore MR-targeted breast biopsy. And much of uh, what was performed way back in the early 2000s was easily migrated to prostate. And uh, slowly we were able to uh, move prostate MRI into the forefront so that random biopsy could be a thing of the past and potentially even digital rectal exam. So I always say, if it looks like a skunk and it smells like a skunk, it's probably a skunk. If you could see it and you could put a needle in it, you could biopsy it. So in the timeline of the literature, uh, we'll take a walk from the 1920s to a little uh, before present day. In the 20s, they would do an incision in the perineum, look around and feel around, and then stick a needle in anything that looked weird. And then in the 30s, they decided, well, let's put a sound, a stainless steel tube down the urethra, and then put the needle into the prostate using the finger as a guide. Um, then in the 60s, things got a little more sophisticated. Uh, Watanabe-san and his team uh, generated the first clinically useful transrectal ultrasound images. And at that same time, McNeil et al. proposed the three distinct glandular zones, the transition zone, the central zone, and the peripheral zone. So whether you're a pathologist, a radiologist, a surgeon, everybody's talking about the same location as it relates to other structures. <clears throat> Then in the 80s, the ultrasound technology evolved to where endocavity transducers were made available to do things like transvaginal ultrasound for follicle count, for infertility, and other uh, clinical indications, but also for transrectal uh, ultrasound of the prostate gland. Uh, Dick Ablin, my friend, developed the PSA test, and in 1986, it was FDA cleared for prostate cancer screening. And in late 89, Hodge et al. developed the sextant biopsy technique, which was six kind of random samples of uh, six areas of the prostate gland. Then in the 90s, Stamian Eskew thought, well, if six is good, 12 is better. And we got, you know, not just the little red dots, but we got the red dots, the blue dots, and a combination of the red, the blue, and the green. But the problem is if the tumor is here or the tumor is here or the tumor is here, you're gonna miss it even with this aggressive schema for taking samples. Winston Barzell came up with a transperineal approach for template mapping biopsy by which um, patient is put in a lithotomy position like a birthing position and a template is put on the perineum, the crotch, and then every three millimeters samples are taken. So, you know, anywhere between, you know, 30 and 100 cores every three millimeters in the X and Y direction. The problem is this didn't really take into account Z, the depth. So um, these nice slides were provided to me by my friend, Dr. Tom Palasic at Duke University, just illustrating 
what a saturation biopsy looks like. So this is a picture of the monitor of the ultrasound unit. The reflection is the clinician with gloved hands holding the ultrasound transducer. And this picture is the transducer in the patient's rectum with the needle going into the prostate. And then this is the inferior wall, the urinary bladder, and the black area is urine. So the patient's head is way up here and their feet are way down here. And what you're seeing is the needle going into the gland kind of in a haphazard random sort of a way, but that's the best they had at that time. And here's Mr. Mann and he's up in the stirrups and we got ABC, one, two, three, I sunk your battleship and you end up with this. So from a cost containment standpoint, you know, I get, I had a lot of people uh, complain to me, the MRI is so expensive. Oh my goodness, what are we going to do? But from my perspective, pathology is very expensive. Each of these cups is two to $300. And even if you group them by region or by segment, you know, you're looking at a, you know, $1,200, uh, $2,400 histological evaluation. So the cost um, can be debated. And I love this because that's what saturation biopsy is. I've got many men who've come to me with multiple uh, biopsies that are all negative, but the problem was they never got deep enough to get it. So um, this cartoon speaks volumes to that problem. So back in 2004 um, in Heidelberg, there was the first inbore MR guided biopsy performed on a human being. And you could see this little needle guide in the patient's rectum. There's the prostate, there's the bladder, and we're able to use imaging to show areas that are worth sticking a needle into and go after them. So we don't have to do the random poke and hope. So this is an ultrasound image and this is an MRI image. And what would you want guiding your biopsy? So in 2009, the NCCN National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines pretty much said, you know, repeat bad test after bad test after bad test. You know, if you come up empty, do it again. If you still don't get an answer, do it again. But then in 2012, for the first time, multiparametric MRI was mentioned in the NCCN guidelines, talking about using MRI to detect areas that should be biopsied. This followed the European Society of Urogenital Radiology prostate MR guidelines published in 2012. So things tend to happen a little quicker in Europe, and then they get adopted over here once they've been validated. And then this was further supported by the American College of Radiology PIRADS classification, which is the prostate imaging and reporting database where we talk about you know, what's worth sticking a needle into and what's not. And so everything that gets an MRI should have a PIRADS category assigned to it. And basically what it is, is if it's dark on this sequence, dark on this sequence, bright on this sequence, and contrast enhances, and we see a rapid pharmacokinetic uh, response to gadolinium-based contrast, probably you should stick a needle in it. So we've got fancy software that we use for segmentation, modeling, color overlays, um, pharmacokinetic modeling. We could reconstruct in different planes. So there's a lot of fancy things that we're able to do with MR imaging that bring us to the bad actor. So this patient is the best teaching case ever because he's got bilateral uh, prostatitis. So this butterfly shaped red thing is prostatitis or infection. And then these red things right here, those are all BPH nodules. But the one thing that sticks out like a sore thumb is the cancer and there it is. So we biopsied all these areas just to prove what, what we knew. And uh, this was way back in 2009. So this was one of the very first inbore biopsies and it was a great teaching case. Um, the other thing I wanted to just touch on was PSA is great, but PSA in a vacuum isn't very helpful. It's just a number. It's very dependent on the gland size. So if a guy's got a gland the size of a grapefruit and another guy's got a gland the size of a walnut and they both have a PSA of four, the guy with the little walnut prostate is at higher risk of cancer because he's the one that's got the higher PSA density. And PSA density is simply PSA divided by gland volume. It's a very helpful number for clinicians. 
So then in 2016, the NTCN talked about MRI followed by lesion targeting, maximizing detection of high risk disease and limiting the detection of low risk disease. So we all know that low risk disease exists. There's little bitty pepper flakes of three plus three floating around in a lot of men's prostates. Is that worth doing anything about? Most doctors would say no. Um, watch it and wait and just see what happens. It's like a chess game. Uh, but if it's MR visible and it's large volume three plus three, you might want to take action and not go on active surveillance. So there's a very um, uh, fine line between you know doing something for nothing and doing something for something. And the distinction is, is it clinically significant? And that definition may vary depending on who you talk to, but essentially it's the largest volume lesion, you know, over uh, five uh, millimeters, uh, it's MR visible, and it's a, a Gleason score of, you know, three plus three or three plus four or higher. So, you know, these are important things to take into consideration when you consider treatment. Then in 2019, the AUA came out with a policy statement about the use of MRI uh, in diagnosis, staging, and management of prostate cancer. And essentially what they said was any guy with an elevated PSA should get an MRI before anybody puts a needle in them. And these were very well-respected uh, uh, committee members that rendered that recommendation. <clears throat> and then the NCCN further modified their recommendations to include biomarkers. So we've got MR targeting for biopsy, we've got MPMRI, we've got biomarkers, and this is a, a really big shift in thinking because what we've known for a long time is that while MRI is great, it's not perfect. You know, we get an area under the receiver operating curve of 91%, which makes it a really good test, but it's still not perfect. And this was out of uh, my university, Radboud, back in 2006. Then Yale reproduced that study 10 years later, and they were right around the same uh, number, around 96%. So while MRI is great, it's not perfect. So when we add biomarkers to things, it, it performs a little better. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, MR imaging and Gleason grading. Uh, that paper happened to be done at 3T. Um, we have 1.5T. Lots of places have uh, 3T, but not very many, only around 10% have 3T, like 70% have one and a half T and all the rest are less than one and a half T or something different. The things that matter way, way more than field strength are the skill of the person pushing the buttons, a credentialed experienced MR tech that understands MR protocols and the benefits and drawbacks of what they program in. The software has to be up to date able to do high B value diffusion sequences, the coil that's used, the antenna that's used to acquire the images should be a high channel count surface coil. I'm not a believer in endorectal coils. And the reason why is because a lot of my patients don't have a rectum. Uh, if they have post-operative, uh, you know, uh, AP resection, uh, 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 surgical results, they, they can't have anything inserted in there. And there are men that don't want anything put in the rectum. So if we've got to develop a protocol that's as good as an endorectal coil and use a surface coil, well, why not use a surface coil from the beginning? Um, the other thing that matters a lot is the patient prep. You can't eat a bean burrito for breakfast and then go in for a prostate MRI. It's not gonna work. You're gonna have gas in the rectum, peristalsis, all kinds of uh, bad artifacts that make it impossible to interpret the images. The last thing is the skill of the interpreter. It's got to be an experienced radiologist. You know, there's, there's a, I'm not going to say a handful, but there's, there's a, a, a bunch of very, very skilled, experienced radiologists in the world um, that I would trust my loved ones going to get their imaging interpreted by. But the good news is we're coming out with um, uh, computer aided detection, artificial intelligence, machine learning all kinds of wonderful uh, uh, adjuncts to the radiologist. He or she will ultimately render the diagnosis, but there's new technology emerging that'll make it so that you don't have to have, you know, a, a, a John Feller or a Danny Margolis or a Steve Raymond look at your images. Pretty much any radiologist will have 
the tools they need to, to call it what it is. <clears throat> Excuse me. And here's just an example of a patient who came to us from an academic university. On the right, we've got this three Tesla image with perfluorocarbon in the rectum, endorectal coil, and it's a mess. It's, it's not a good image and you can do filtering and window level, all these little adjustments to try to make it better. But when you make the front better, you make the back worse and it's just not a diagnostic image. Then we did the same patient on our little bitty 1.5T and look at the difference. So, you know, and I'm not bashing 3T systems or 3T sites, but what I'm saying is the ACR pretty much uh, agreed, and I serve on the committee, that 1.5T and 3T are equally good for detection and localization of clinically significant disease. Now, is 1.5T as good as 3T for other fancy things that are research only? Probably not. But what we're interested in is localizing and targeting clinically significant cancer. We don't want to pick up every little ditzel thing that we're not going to do anything with anyway. So here's one more example of a lot of uh, blurring and motion on this image on the right. This is three Tesla, same patient a couple days later. Now look at this. We could see all kinds of anatomy and detail and there's no blurring and no ringing. So anything bad at 1.5T is linearly worse at 3T. The higher field strength makes the artifacts, the motion, the bowel gas, all that stuff worse. So back to the paper. This is the key takeaway. When we look at apparent diffusion coefficient value on the diffusion sequence that we typically run with the multi-parametric MRI, the higher the ADC, the lower the Gleason score is the general consensus. So I've got 1,240 here and I got a Gleason three plus three. And this is just a little gray thing. It's unilateral, it's unifocal, it's sitting there by itself. Now look at this. Now I've got an ADC of 990 and it's darker. And this is a three plus four on whole mount histology. Then go to this one, it's black and it's a lower ADC of 660. That's a four plus five on whole mount. So the general consensus is the lower the ADC, the more suspicious it is. So again, if we've got a lesion here, we see it on all these three sequences and then it perfuses wildly and we've got a pharmacokinetic map that is alarming, stick a needle in it. Well, where do you wanna stick the needle? You wanna stick it in the area where the ADC is the lowest. I put the cursor here, I got an ADC of 691. I move that cursor just a couple voxels. Now all of a sudden I'm at an ADC of over a thousand. That's not where I want the biopsy to be procured from. So this is why sometimes people give me a little bit of criticism because I'm so pro MRI and I'm not a fan of ultrasound fusion. While ultrasound fusion is much better than a random truss biopsy, the only thing that can get you into the core, the, low, the, the lowest ADC component, most aggressive part of this heterogeneous lesion is MRI. So that's why I'm a big fan and, and I'm not ashamed to admit it. Uh, not to say other things are bad or wrong. It's just, you know, you've got Jaguars and you've got Volkswagens. <clears throat> the other problem I talked about earlier was you could biopsy this guy all day, every day for 10 years and you're never gonna get the lesion. And the problem is the reach of the throw of the truss biopsy needle is 1.7 centimeters. If it's a large gland and this thing lives way out in the anterior component of the gland, you're gonna miss it no matter how many times you biopsy him. So MRI is really wonderful at figuring out what's the dominant lesion, what's inconsequential, where should we throw the needle? Because if, if, you, if you put it here, you pick up something less aggressive and you miss this thing, put the guy in active surveillance and end up with a problem down the road. And the other issue is sometimes just skimming the tumor where you miss the aggressive part, the low ADC part, and you get some other little piece of it and, and undergrade it or understage it. There was a great experiment done at Radboud where my colleague Tom Hambrock compared MR guided biopsy to 10 core random biopsy. And you can see that there's like a double uh, detection in Gleason grade greater than or equal to seven disease. 
So clinically significant disease and almost not getting missed ever with MR guided biopsy. And there are many papers out there describing you know, the use and, and utility of, of MR targeting. So what does it look like, like for the man? He lays on the MRI table, there's a, a coil or antenna that's in a padded uh, device wrapped around him or one under him and one on top of him. There are different configurations. Then a little needle guide is put into the rectum and mounted to a little stand that allows us to angle left, right, front, back and insert and retract in the head foot direction. So here we're able to use software to plan the trajectory of the device that we're inserting so that we aim precisely at what it is we're going after. And here's a picture of our friendly neighborhood urologist doing a targeted biopsy. And then when the needle comes out, it gets opened up and these little tiny wormy looking things, these are cores, these come out and they get sliced and prepared and put under the microscope by the pathologist who then renders a diagnosis. And I work very closely with our pathologists to create a report that on page one says in big capital letters, red font, what's going on? And then there's a table of each, each specimen, diagnosis, length of core, length of cancer involvement, and Gleason score. And then any narrative. And not only do we get a photomicrograph, but we get a little image of the needle in the thrown position. So in a court of law, it's indisputable where this tissue came from. And Gleason scoring is pretty much like Skittle sorting. Gleason grade determines Gleason score. What do I mean by that? So there's the primary Gleason grade and the secondary Gleason grade. So the pathologist puts the thing under the microscope and looks at what's there the most of, and that's the primary Gleason grade. And then what's there the next most of? That's a secondary Gleason grade. I won't get into tertiary grades because that's beyond the scope, but um, the primary plus the secondary is a Gleason score. So let's say my neighbor goes in and has a biopsy and the dominant cell pattern is three and the secondary pattern is four. He is a three plus four equal to seven. Okay, let's say my other neighbor goes in and he has a biopsy and under the microscope, there's a lot of four and a little bit less of three. So he's a four plus three, also a seven, but his prognosis is worse because he has a more aggressive dominant cell pattern, if that makes sense. And if you've got questions, you can always email me or call me. So whenever a patient comes to us requesting treatment, we make sure that myself, our, our uh, urology nurse and our director of urology, um, who is a urologist, uh, we talk about what are, what are the mainstream options? What are, what are the things that would ordinarily be recommended? And we put all options on the table and then we talk about what we do. And what we do was originally uh, investigated for safety and feasibility in a phase one clinical trial. It's in phase two right now, we're no longer accruing subjects, but we're watching our patients for 20 years each. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what do we do and how do we do it? We have a little needle guide, like just what we use for the biopsy. It's the exact same thing. And it's very tiny. That's my hand and I'm a little woman and I have a very small index finger. This thing is smaller than my index finger. That goes in the rectum. And then we insert an applicator uh, with a um, laser fiber eventually placed into it. Uh, in the beginning, we put it in there with a stiffener. Then we replace a stiffener with a laser with a heat diffusing tip. And uh, sometimes if it's a fibrous gland, we'll use a 14 gauge titanium needle uh, to penetrate through tissue to get to our target. So this device was originally used in the brains of children for intractable epilepsy. This is a brain up here. And I thought to myself, well, if it's safe enough to stick in the brain of a kid, why not stick it in the prostate? And we use MR targeting to get into the tumor and thermal mapping to observe what the temperature change is over the course of time and irreversible damage estimates to see how much tissue we've killed and when we can stop. So all this stuff is 510K cleared by the FDA. Um, we're using everything in accordance with their indications. It's still considered experimental, however, because uh, there are very few sites in the world doing it. When I invented it, I taught 
a handful of doctors how to do it and ended up going to the place I felt most comfortable working. And, um, you know, we, we've been at it now, it'll be 12 years on May 24th, 2022. So what it looks like is we've got a visualization platform that shows a graph of the temperature change over time, a thermal map showing temperature in the treatment area, an anatomic image showing the anatomy of the patient and a cumulative irreversible damage estimate that shows how much tissue should be dead based on uh, anything that reached a temperature over 60 degrees Celsius. So essentially what we do is we contour an area around what we wanna kill and then we put these blue safety cursors over things that we don't wanna kill. So should the temperature exceed a preset threshold, the system shuts off even without any user interaction. So this is how we protect the neurovascular bundles responsible for erection, the uh, external urethral sphincter responsible for urinary continence and the rectal wall so that we don't get rectal fistula or other severe surgical complications. And initially we just administer a little test dose. We could look at what we're doing once we confirm where we belong, we up the energy and start burning. And then that's when this little irreversible damage estimate shows up. And when it's over, what you have is a black hole of tissue necrosis. And I'm just like, you know, millimeters away from the capsule, the neurovascular bundles, and didn't do any harm to this man. And this was a three plus four equal to seven. And then here's the post treatment image with this big area of coagulation necrosis where the tumor once was. And there's no tumor there any longer. There's the thermal map showing what we were killing as we killed it. And then this is a side view of that same tumor. Up here is the bladder. You see that white area? This blob here is the prostate. This gray, this blackish grayish area is the coagulation necrosis that we induced. And this man came back for his six month follow-up. And because he was a research subject, we always biopsy the treatment area even in the absence of imaging findings to make sure there's nothing microscopic brewing that may declare itself later. We always biopsy the treatment site and he had a negative six month biopsy and he's living happily ever after. So remember earlier I said, you know, we've got this um, ability to stay away from important stuff. The way that we do it is different than other energy sources. Uh, back in 2008 and 2009, when I conceptualized this technique, I looked at all the different FDA cleared energy sources and the thing that performed above and beyond everything else in every area was laser. And one of the main reasons why is when you look at the transition zone between dead tissue, which is this white stuff here and this yellow stuff, which is untreated tissue, the transition zone is like a millimeter. So it's very crisp. When you look at cryo and HIFU and other energy sources, we've got a five to 10 millimeter transition zone between what's been killed and what's still viable. And this fluffy border between those two areas is where cancers can recur. That's why the recurrence rates for cryo and HIFU are so high. So talking about our study, um, the data is, as far as our biostatistician has been able to provide to me most recently, and, and this is worth mentioning, I don't analyze our data and publish it. I analyze it all right, and I look at it and I get a vibe for what's going on, but I have an outside biostatistician who gets our anonymized data, and he uh, got his PhD at Rutgers University, and he runs the analytics on all of our data. So it's not that I get up at the podium and I say this, that, and the other thing. It's that an outsider uh, did the analytical uh, evaluation. So um, in our cohort, we had um, 181 patients and 291 lesions. Um, the ages of the patients were a good distribution. In the treatment naive group, in other words, the men that were newly diagnosed and never got treated, um, the vast majority were between 60 and 80. Um, also in the salvage limb, the men who had had treatment and their cancer came back, and they came to us to get rid of it. 
Um, again, it was 60 to 80. Tumor location statistics. In the treatment naive group, the vast majority of tumors were in the peripheral zone. And we know this, most cancers occur in the peripheral zone. However, in the salvage limb, the guys that had been treated previously, most were in the peripheral zone, plenty were in the transition zone. We had some central zone, seminal vesicle, bladder wall, and other places that we treated in our salvage patients. For them, it's palliative. We wanna get in there and debulk the tumors and get rid of the mother ship so that we interrupt the metastatic potential of the disease. And then um, I always hate it when people say, oh goodness, um, you guys have such good numbers because you only do three plus three. And that's not true. Um, the vast majority of our patients are three plus four in the treatment naive setting and all comers in the salvage setting. And looking at our PSA results, what happens is after the laser, um, we see a PSA decline of around 40% overall. Uh, it tends to be a lot more in the salvage group because they present with higher PSAs in the beginning. And then when we look at sexual health, there's no statistically significant change in sexual health in either population. With regard to urinary function, we have less than 1% incontinence rate, and there's a, a, a insignificant uh, change in urinary function in both populations. The one thing that I find really interesting is PHQ-9, emotional well-being surveys, the measure of how How's their heart? You know, we all know there are things like, like incontinence and sexual health, but how's his, how's his mind? How's his heart doing? And when you measure the level of distress in the treatment naive patients, you see that, you know, they're, they're happy. They're doing good. By about 12 months, their, their, their energy and their, their mood is boosted, but it's even more pronounced in the salvage group because they come in pretty upset. And then by three months, they're really worried. And then at six months, they're kind of like, okay, back to baseline. And then they're feeling much better at a year. So this is an important component of our research is to make sure that we're not just measuring data points. We wanna know holistically, how are these people doing? And in terms of our 10 year biopsy results, the, the great news is that the clinically significant cancer recurrence rate is only 21%. And that's right in line with prostatectomy and radiation. But again, the good news is the incontinence and impotence and other uh, horrible side effects are almost completely avoided. Looking at um, metastasis-free survival, 99%. We've only had one patient develop bone mets in 12 years. And uh, this is 11 years, but we're almost at 12 years and we've had zero patients die of their prostate cancer in 11 years. Not to say patients have not died of other things, but none have died of their prostate cancer. So why are we doing this? Uh, it was a theory that it would be safe and precise and outpatient feasible. We're able to sculpt the therapy and have a little tiny transition zone that's uh, very, very uh, precise and controllable biplane real-time thermometry lets us visualize what we're killing as we kill it. And it's very amenable to apical cancers. When you look at the anatomy of the prostate, the bottom of it, it's pear-shaped, or it's a, a peach-shaped. Uh, and the little bottom of the peach is the apex. And that little corner is tricky to get into. So we've developed very uh, interesting techniques to be able to get into the apex, that tricky little area, and, uh, you know, uh, aggressively treat the cancer without damaging important structures. And now we get to the topic I call whack-a-mole. So when a patient gets treated and the cancer comes back at the treated area, that's one thing. We go back in and treat it. <clears throat> if the cancer comes back in a new area, we can also go in and treat it. But if it comes back in the treated area, plus two or three new areas, we call that whack-a-mole. And we really don't want to chase that thing around and put this guy through hardship and you know, make him undergo repeat treatments, we wanna move on to whole gland therapy, which would likely be the best scenario. Another tool that we've adopted over the last 10 years is genomic testing. There are lots of tests out there, um, lots of brands, lots of names. What is it, why does it matter? 
So um, <clears throat> Decipher is a test that used to be only used for post-op prostatectomy specimens. In other words, they would do the prostatectomy, they would put the specimen under a microscope, take out pieces of the tumor, look at RNA and decide, is it low, intermediate or high risk? And would this patient benefit from radiation on top of their surgery? And then about nine years ago, I approached the guy that invented this and I asked him, why don't you do it for biopsy? And he goes, I never will. And I said, why not? And he said, because biopsy is imprecise and it's random. And I said, well, what if I gave you pores that were aimed at the worst part of the tumor that were MR targeted? If I gave you a 1.8 centimeter core, is that enough tissue for you to get RNA and to run the test? So fast forward to February, 2016, Decipher for Biopsy was released. So what I did was I went back in our cohort and I got as many patients to consent to getting this run on their initial pretreatment uh, biopsy cores. And I was able to look at a clinical gene panel of 22 genes and a research panel of 1.4 million genomic markers and make some assumptions and conclusions that correlated with clinical outcomes, which is a really helpful tool for us. <clears throat> So beyond radiogenomics, and radiogenomics is essentially the marrying of imaging and genomic testing, um, on the horizon is interesting radio pharmaceuticals for PET-CT and theranostic agents that can be used both for diagnosis and therapy. Right now at Halo Diagnostics in our Indian Wells office, we have Pylarify, and uh, literally yesterday, uh, Pluvicto was FDA cleared. So I've been working on that for about five years and all the parts and pieces are pretty much in place. It's gonna take a little bit of work, but hopefully soon we'll have Letitium 177. So again, uh, my disclosures were pretty much the patent and also I'm clinical instructor at UC Riverside School of Medicine, co-founder, vice president of the International Laser Network, which a couple of years ago got absorbed by the Focal Therapy Society. We are now a chapter of the Focal Therapy Society, but our leadership remained intact and our patient advisory council remained intact. And I must thank my fearless leader, Dr. John Feller, our chief medical officer and my mentor, Dr. Stuart May, who since passed away, who did the first human being with me and Dr. Feller on May 24, 2010, Roger McNichols, who, uh, pretty much invented the Visual Ace platform. Uh, the folks at Invivo Germany who helped me put all this together, our technologist Wes, our interventional radiologist Steve Gunberg, our urologist uh, Jeffrey Herz, and our biostatistician Rob Toth. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Bernadette, appreciate it. You're most yeah. welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I know Dr. Metzger has a, a comment before we go to your questions. Sure. Thank you very Dr. much. For, hi, thank you very much for just an excellent talk, just bringing us up to date. We've actually had quite a few questions about focal therapy, even tonight uh, in our, in our uh, group. And it's, it's good to, to hear this information. Um, I, I think, you know, anything we can do to, to move this along. Um, move the needle. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Speaking of needles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so punny. <laughs> no, I, I just, just had two comments. I just wonder what your view of this micro uh, ultrasound, the 29 megahertz ultrasound is going to do in the might do away with the MRI. I, I, I'm it not may, sure. it may. I know the Rotterdam team's been looking at it for years, and I know that it's you know come to fruition here in the United States. Um, when, when you look at multi-parametric MRI and how long it took for it to come to where it is now, how long will it take for micro ultrasound, especially multi-parametric multi, -parametric multi uh, micro ultrasound? How long is that going to take? Uh, we both know that pretty much anything in medicine takes around 10 years. So it's FDA cleared, it's being used. Um, it can be used in clinic by the urologist and that's great. Um, but it, again, you know, I talk about the Volkswagen and the Jaguar. 
and, and I'm not saying it's bad or wrong or anything like that. It's just that, you know, if it's my husband or my dad, I know exactly what I'm going to do with them. And it probably, you know, would be MR, but that's, I'm so biased and I admit that. And I let the world know that at the beginning. So I think, I think you'd be shocked by how many of men come to our newly diagnosed that have not had MRIs before the biopsy. It just, it, it has taken a long time. I just wonder if getting the ultrasound back in the urology office, if they might be more apt to adapt to it sooner. Possibly, but it's got to, it's got to bear itself out. There's got to be a head to head clinical trial, uh, multi-parametric MRI versus micro ultrasound. That's got to happen. And I don't believe it has. The no. other thing I wanted to point out is Upton Sinclair said, you can't incentivize a man to understand that for which he's been paid to not understand. So there is a turf battle here. There's two disciplines that are not fighting with each other, but they've got to hold hands and sing kumbaya at and some point. People are still getting married and that uh, applies to that too. Right. Um, dear, your other comment about the pluvicto, of yes. course, that's only in castrate resistant that have tried everything else. It's correct. exactly a breakthrough yet, but it's coming. And, and as, as, they, as they move that needle along, that's going to be the huge change. Big deal, I, I, big deal. Because radium-223, you know, yeah, yeah. is what it is. But um, I've sent two patients outside the U.S., uh, one to Australia, one to Germany under clinical trial, and they did remarkably well. And, uh, you know, we cannot wait to get it in our hands. And oh, yeah. I had I had the protocol. I had everything all written up and ready to go to do it under research with Novartis. And then I got the news yesterday that it was FDA cleared. Yeah, That's exactly yeah. what happened to me with DCFPYL. I was all ready to go with the protocol. And then I saw, oh, my God, it's commercial. So thank yeah. goodness these men now have access. Yeah, this is really, things are changing. It's hard. I to know. Talk. But I just want you to know how much we appreciate your effort tonight. Just brilliant. My Thank pleasure. You. My pleasure. It's always an honor to talk to these gentlemen and their families. And I'm sure others have questions. So I'll mute sure. myself. <laughs> well, our own Ira Caggett actually has three questions here. Oh, my gosh. Yes, that's Ira. Uh, I hear that 15 to 30 percent of cancers are not detected by MRI. Do you do random? biopsy in addition to targeted to find these cancers? Ira, that's a great question. So the way that we work that and the numbers you cite are a little higher than what I see in other literature. There are different papers that cite different numbers. The number that's usually talked about in radiology meetings is around eight to 10%. At urology meetings, they say it's like 15 to 30. But again, little turf battle. Um, the way that we get around that little thing is, uh, any, any guy with insurance that comes to us for multi-parametric MRI is told to urinate before he gets on the table and, oh, by the way, pee in this cup and we'll get XODX on you. So these MR occult or MR invisible lesions that you're talking about, you know, if the guy has nothing shown on his MRI, has a high PSA and a high XODX, he'll probably go for random systematic biopsy. While it's not as good as MR targeted biopsy, if we see nothing on the MR, there's nothing to target. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, he also wants to know, I hear that an endorectal coil helps him, helps to improve the image of a 1.5 uh, Tesla. Tesla so that the image is comparable to a 3.0. How That's much? All, does, yeah, if we go, go back to that slide that I showed earlier about the five things that are way more important than field strength. Listen, I've been working in MR physics for 30 years. I'm an old lady in this business. You know, when, when, when we first released the 3T scanners at GE, we called it the bunny scanner because all you could fit in it was a rabbit and the enclosure was so small, then it got bigger. We were able to do brains and necks and cervical spines. Then everybody thought, well, the imaging isn't that great. You know, wherever there was an air tissue interface, we had these bad artifacts. Um, wherever there was movement of any kind, we had blurring. So in addition to the acquisition pulse sequence, we had to do a pre-pulse sequence to make all that stuff go away. So any theoretical gain that you got in signal to noise and decrease in scan time 
was almost negated, you know, and, and that's not, you know, we're talking about seconds, not hours, not, not minutes, but seconds, you know, so a scan will take a little bit longer at 1.5 T versus 3 T. And remember what I said, anything bad at 1.5 T is worse at 3 T. What do you have in the pelvis? Peristalsis, bowel gas. Some men have hip arthroplasty, metal. So no man who wants a biopsy or an MRI or an MR targeted biopsy or laser under MR guidance would wanna have it done at three Tesla because the diffusion sequence is a big blur. It's just garbage. You can't see anything. And if any of you follow me on Twitter, I posted that and made some enemies but it's the truth and I'm, I'm not gonna be dishonest. I'm just gonna say why we do what we do. Many of the instruments that we use are FDA cleared up to three Tesla. Many of them are up to 1.5 T. So, you know, we have to work with what we have and there's also the point of diminished returns. What do I have to give up to do three T versus 1.5 T? Is 1.5 T good enough? I would say yes, because the American College of Radiology Prostate Site Designation Committee used our images to train their image evaluators. So if ever you attend an ACR meeting, they talk about, yeah, yeah, those guys, yeah, <laughs> they know what they're doing, so. And finally, uh, Ira asks, over what period of time are your patients monitored as after laser focal? I assume by monitored, you mean? Uh, Observation, yeah. So okay. we watch them for 20 years or until they expire. I mentioned we had five patients pass away of something other than their prostate cancer. So they have, if they're a research subject, there's, and this is talking in the past, if they were a research subject in phase one, they were seen at 48 hours, they were seen at three months, they were seen at six months, 12 months, and then every year thereafter. They were brought into the phase two trial by informed consent, phase two, we collect uh, PSA and surveys at three months. We see them at six months and we perform MR targeted biopsy, even if there's no imaging evidence of malignancy, again, because we wanna pick up anything microscopic in the treatment area that might declare itself later. Then they're seen at one year and every year thereafter for 19 more years or until they expire of something else. Okay, thank you very much. Um... How about new patients? We do them commercially and we treat them exactly as we treat the research patients. However, we omit the MRI, the MRI guided biopsy at six months, even if we see nothing. So let's say the patient comes back at six months, we see nothing, we don't do a biopsy, unlike the research patients. Good move. Okay. Um, Phil wants to know, how do you deal with claustrophobic patients in MRI? Drugs, drugs. There's lots of great drugs out there. Valium, Benzos. Xanax, we have a sedation nurse. Yeah, no problem. Hey, listen, I'll go in there and hold their hand if they need me to. I've gotten well, flowers for that. Uh, basically, yeah. Uh, I, my, my cousin gets a, a, a tranquilizer before getting dental work done. He gets claustrophobic. Listen, I've had so many MRIs, whether it was in R&D uh, or for clinical reasons, I take a nap. It doesn't bother me a bit, but. You know, you know what I like about MRIs? They're not exploratory operations like they used to do 50 years ago. There you go, exactly. We're not opening anybody up to go nope. in there. And that's usually the thing I'm thinking about in an MRI. Noise go, easy, go easy on us, Neil. Pardon me? Go easy on us. <laughs> oh, the, oh, yes, from, from 40, the 50 years ago. Well, we did things that we thought were right back then. And but that's all they had. They did the best had. thing that they could with what they had. Exactly. And, and what we're doing today could be gone in five or 10 years. You know, But what we're trying to do is put together an ensemble. It's not that laser focal therapy is the be all end all, but it's really good right now. Today in 2022, it's really good. But it's got to be preceded in the timeline, when I look at the left end of the timeline of the natural history of this disease, you've got screening, diagnosis, uh, treatment, possible retreatment. Then down the road, we end up with the sad face, the metastatic, metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer, and we've got to insert all this crazy stuff. 
uh, abiraterone and zalutamide, radium-223 and all this stuff. If we get in at the left end of the timeline, we stop, we interrupt the mothership and the little minions that go and do their harm. That's our philosophy. Uh, Hashim Ahmed from UC London did a great paper on the monoclonal nature of lethal metastatic disease. And his idea, his concept was that there's a single uh, index lesion that feeds the rest of the body. And it's very interesting because the AUA, like, I don't know, eight years ago or something, some guy got up and said, oh, wait, I've got one case of a dude who you know had therapy and, and it wasn't monoclonal and yeah, okay, one out of how many million? All right, so there are outliers in pretty much everything. But when we look you know, in aggregate, listen, if, if you can go after that mothership and, and stop it from getting to where bad things have to happen and quality of life deteriorates, that's what we wanna do. And then if you do that, we'd be more honest about recurrence rates, side effects, which we haven't really been terribly honest about. Right, because who gets a 20 year follow up after radiation therapy? Yeah. Nobody. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Phil has work to do. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No. Um, Phil has a, a two part question. A second question is how do you do a TP biopsy with MPMRI? You put the patient in the lithotomy position and you put a template on the crotch and it's mounted to the MRI table. So the patient's gotta be kind of small. I did some at Harvard with Dr. Claire Tempany. We don't do transperineal uh, biopsy at our place. We only do transrectal in the MR, um, but I did a few with them and uh, you know, it, it requires a lot more anesthesia energy and resources, but you know, some people feel that that's the way to go. And I know the Australian groups were the first to bring up, you know, bizarre bacterial infections and things like that. But those are typically geographic. And we've seen a less than 1% infection rate in our cohorts. So, um, and we published and it's in the AUS supplements. So we're not too concerned about it. And a lot of people talk about rectal swabs and uh, boutique antibiotics. We just use rocephin. Uh, we had a, a cliforin regimen uh, coupled with, um, uh, it escapes me now, I'm just stuck on row seven. <laughs> but anyway, we had all kinds of IV antibiotic regimens and our patients go on oral antibiotics when they hit the road after laser because they have a catheter in place. But the biopsy patients get row seven. Uh, Ira wants to know, not a, 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 what, you know, any ideas about Tulsa Pro? Have you had any experience? Yeah, in fact, I did Tulsa Pro training in 2018 at Vanderbilt University. Uh, we installed our first unit at our Houston office. Um, we're going to get it at one of our offices in Florida. And I just met with the Tulsa Pro team on Monday because they were in Waukesha, Wisconsin in the GE MRI bays uh, testing their system on a new GE scanner. So um, do I love Tulsa Pro? Uh, it's, it's okay for certain things. Uh, when, I look, when I look at a prostate that looks like this and there's a lesion right here and that's it, that's a laser case. When I look at a prostate and there's something here, something here, something there and something there, and it's a small gland, why not do Tulsa Pro? It's transurethral, it goes in through the penis. It's got an applicator that, that has an aperture and it does a radial treatment. So, I mean, you could do like kind of a, you know, a 90 degree, a 180 degree, or you could do the whole 360 with Tulsa Pro. And, um, you know, all things to all people, you know. Excellent. Uh, Aloysius asks, I had, a, I had just undergone focal cryoablation. If my cancer comes back at the same location, can I undergo laser focal? Absolutely. I actually published that. Um, I had a case, I had a, had a few cases of salvage patients, uh, two brachytherapies, one proton and one cryo. They were my first four salvage patients and I presented them at the European Society of uh, Magnetic Resonance in Medicine and Biology and Edinburgh, Scotland, like 
seven years ago. And what I showed was it doesn't matter what treatment the patient had. If there's no danger of hurting other stuff, we could put the laser in because we've got different sizes. We've got different energies that we could apply. So we're totally in control of what we're doing. We've even had guys with prostatectomy that come back to us because uh, one Canadian, they didn't remove the seminal vesicles. So he had a prostatectomy with seminal vesicles left intact and he got a recurrence in the seminal vesicles. So we went and debulked that. We had another patient from North Carolina who had a prostatectomy and the cancer came back in the surgical bed and we were able, and this is also on Twitter, I called it, this is tricky. Now you see it, now you don't. So we were able to localize the recurrence in the surgical bed with MRI. Uh, I believe we might've even done axumen on him and then we localized it and got rid of it. Oh, and same Al, goes for cryo. Al, did that answer your question? I see you nodding. You good? If you want, press your space bar down and it'll, it'll unmute you. Okay. Um, anybody else with a question tonight? No. But thank you, thank you. You're most welcome. This is very helpful. Aaron. I had a question. Uh, oh, I'm is sorry. this covered by, uh, um, by Medicare and Medigap policies? Is this covered by insurance? Oh, I'm actually working with um, a consulting company and also with Kaiser to try to approve the economy behind this. I mean, it's much cheaper than other solutions but it's still considered experimental until we've got 15 years of evidence. CMS is never gonna assign a CPT code and insurance will never cover it. So it is a cash pay only. But that being said, I had a patient give me a quarter million dollars with which I started a foundation. I gave the money away and I don't have anything to do with it. And it's called the Focal Therapy Foundation. So they, they weigh and evaluate financial need and on a sliding scale, they'll provide X percent contribution to get it done. Um, the other thing is I had a guy who did not qualify for the Focal Therapy Foundation because he made too much money, but he still didn't think he could afford it. So he did a GoFundMe. And instead of getting 25,000 that would cover the procedure, he ended up getting like 40,000 between his friends, family, and coworkers. So it's not an unmanageable situation, but you know, economically it's, it's not uh, reimbursed at this juncture. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Bob wants to know how does MRI compare to PMSA PET in reoccurrence? PSMA in recurrence. So PSMA stands for prostate specific membrane antigen. So MRI is looking at anatomy and function. We use a gadolinium based contrast to see vascularity. We use diffusion weighting to see Brownian motion and compactness of cells in a group, which happens in infection, inflammation, and malignancy. So um, they work well together. So a PMSA, a, P, a PSMA scan would typically be recommended in a guy who's got an elevated PSA and we're concerned either about biochemical occurrence or for staging. The MRI, like I said, is anatomic and functional the PSMA goes to prostate cells, prostate cancer cells and sticks to them. So it will show local disease in the prostate. It will show lymph node involvement and it will also show osseous structures, bones that have been invaded by prostate cancer cells. So that's the difference. The MRI is limited to a field of view of anywhere between you know, 16, 22 centimeters to cover the prostate and surrounding anatomy and then one wide field of view of the pelvis, but it doesn't go up into the axillary lymph nodes. It doesn't go up into the neck or into the abdomen. So that's, that's kind of the main difference. They're two different modalities and it's not that one is superior to the other, but they're just used for different purposes. Excellent. A question from Aaron. Uh, you mentioned you are working with Kaiser. Is it to offer the treatment to Kaiser? What I proposed, and this is a kind of a, I'm not gonna call it a confidential discussion, but I, I met with um, one of the VPs here in the Coachella Valley and I, um, excuse me. 
make sure there was a patient. Um, I proposed to her that we do an economic analysis, that we do a study and we randomize patients to prostatectomy, radiation and laser. And we monitor the cost over five years to deal with what was picked. And so randomized controlled trials are the highest level of evidence and research. Longitudinal observational studies like what I'm doing is a low level of, of evidence. But for our study, we didn't want to randomize guys. I mean, you don't, you, you, yeah, you just want to do it and see how it works. Uh, randomization didn't seem um, um, ethical in our phase two study. Thank you. And I'm also approaching the VA. I've been approaching the VA. I'm a veteran myself. I served uh, six years active duty. I'm a combat medic. Um, I have great love for my brothers in arms and I wanna make this available at the VA. And uh, I, I have yet to find a person in power that can come out and visit and look at what we do and how we do it and why we do it and what our results are. Because I think our, um, especially our Agent Orange veterans would greatly benefit from this. And, and you know, there are enough quality of life issues upon, uh, you know, ETS, you know, you get out and then there's very little in terms of integration into civilian society. There's quality of life issues. You know, that's the last thing that these guys need. Would anybody else like to uh, ask a question? I'm looking in chat and have room for we have we have about 15 minutes more yeah we're good uh doctor any any comments that you no want? i think we should be still upon uh dr greenwood her phd almost tonight. dr greenwood <laughs> and, but, but yeah so we're going to call it almost dr greenwood yes well no it's it's after tonight it's dr greenwood no. <laughs> thank you gentlemen you've been very gracious uh, if there's anything else you need, you let me know. Um, you all have my email. It's Bernadette at halodx.com. And uh, it was a privilege to be here with you tonight. Uh, you. An amazing presentation. Absolutely amazing. And I sensed it would be. Unfortunately, I missed you the last time around. Uh, and we look forward to having you back very soon. And please keep uh, Dr. Metzger posted on your progress with everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good with night, that, gentlemen. Thank you. Night, you. I'm going Bye -bye. to conclude the meeting. Join us next month this time as we explore Theranostics with Dr. Lenzo, who is one of the pioneers of Theranostics. Watch your mailbox, watch your email box, and uh, we will send you invites and Zoom links. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night.